This week on CrossFeed, a special episode with a guest to discuss the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America's churchwide assembly's controversial response to gay clergy with special guest Rev. Dr. Richard Johnson. Johnson is the pastor of Peace Lutheran Church in Grass Valley, California. He is the editor of Forum Letter, which is published by the American Lutheran Publicity Bureau. Uh, if you are Lutheran and you do not subscribe to for- Lutheran Forum and Forum Letter, you are missing some of the best Lutheran discussion uh, on the market from the evangelical Lutheran perspective. I've been a subscriber for many years and just really appreciate Dr. Johnson's insights and uh, his writing immensely. And I encourage you um, to subscribe today. You may dispense with the pleasantries, Commander. So welcome, everyone, uh, to CrossFeed Religious News. Uh, if you I have a hunch we're going to end up having some new viewers on this show or at least one-time viewers uh, because it's very different from what we've done in the past. Uh, normally, we pick five stories of religious news from the past week or so, and we talk about them. This week, instead of doing that, uh, we have a very special uh, guest, and we will be showing that interview in a minute. Uh, now, we did end up running into some, some bandwidth problems uh, partway through the interview, and um, so if you're watching the video, uh, we apologize for that. I'm not exactly sure what happens. I think it comes down to unlimited bandwidth. It's still not available everywhere. Um, so the picture gets bad, but the sound stays good uh, pretty much right up to the end. So, um, you know, anybody that has questions about uh, the things that, that we discuss, and, and what we're talking about is the ELCA's decision to allow gay clergy. Um, and so I encourage you to, to listen closely uh, to what Dr. Johnson has to say. Uh, very intelligent, really, you know, appreciate his comments. Uh, not only intelligent, but pastoral. And, um, and, and so, uh, you know, here's Jim and I could sit and talk about this as a couple of LCMS pastors, and it's going to come off pretty biased. And, you know, everybody's got their bias. Uh, but, you know, we thought, you know, if we're going to talk about this, it really makes sense to have someone on the show who knows about this stuff, who's in the middle of it, you know, that, that is, is one of them in a sense. Um, and, and not just a, you know, a good old boys club sitting around talking and, and saying, uh, you know, those bad guys. And so, um, so that's what we wanted to do. And we're really, really excited about having this interview. And, uh, we should also mention that, uh, Dr. Johnson was at the church wide assembly, live blogging it for the American Lutheran Publicity Bureau. Uh, you can get more of his conversation, more conversation on this, at the American Lutheran Publicity, Publicity Bureau's website, alpb.org. That's Alpha, Lambda, Beta, uh, Alpha, Lambda, <laughs> uh, uh, Peter, uh, Beta.org. We'll put a link in the show notes. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So, hey, what can I say? By the way, we should introduce ourselves, especially for our new visitors. I am Pastor Jim Butler. I serve as pastor of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston. And I'm Pastor Dale Critchley at Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio, uh, just outside of Cleveland. So with that, we begin our interview then with Dr. Johnson. So I, I was the plug good enough, Rich? <laughs> <laughs> the plug was great. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, Maybe that's what unplugged you. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Okay, uh, I'm going to start off then. Um, could you share with us a little bit, Pastor Johnson, kind of what led up to the decision? I mean, obviously somebody just stand up there and say, I think this is a good idea, and ever go, yeah, we agree. I mean, you guys have been doing sexuality studies since, what, mid-1990s, as I recall? Uh, so what kind of led up to this happening? Yeah, that's that's a really good question, and um, actually there's a prehistory that goes back much farther than that. Uh, both the American Lutheran Church and the Lutheran Church in America had social statements that had to do with sexuality or with uh, marriage and family life, 
And at the time of the ELCA merger in uh, 1987-88, um, we were sort of starting with a clean slate, uh, so to speak, and uh, all of those previous statements were um, uh, were uh, sort of received as historical documents, and the ELCA didn't have any documents itself that had to do with social issues. Uh, and so in the early years of the ELCA, there was a, um, kind of an effort to sort of find our footing and to begin a process uh, for uh, developing uh, statements on one or another social issue. Uh, the sexuality thing came to the fore um, probably in the early 90s was the first effort to uh, develop a social statement on human sexuality. And uh, it was uh, kind of a disaster. Um, uh, there was uh, a draft that came out um, that both was regarded by many as just being way off the charts in terms of um, uh, what it was advocating, and it had the, the added disadvantage of having not been handled very well so that um, it suddenly showed up in the newspaper headlines without anybody out in the field even knowing that it was coming. And... Uh, as a result of that process, um, that, uh, well, somebody lost their job or at least got reassigned uh, over that issue, and the thing was sort of quietly shelved. Um, shortly after that, the decision was made to ask the church council of the ELCA to develop um, what we call a message, which is uh, sort of... Um, not quite as serious as a social statement, but it's uh, kind of a, a consensus thing that doesn't require um, church, uh, church-wide assembly approval. And so the ELCA Church Council adopted this message in, uh, I think it was 1996, which uh, took uh, the things from that earlier process that everybody pretty much agreed on, uh, but did not say anything about homosexuality. Uh, then in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, there was another effort to set up a task force and begin the rather long process. And usually when we develop a social statement, it takes um, six or eight years to really uh, come from you know, beginning to, to final uh, fruition. Uh, and so that's the process that we've been in since I think about 2001. Um, there were a couple of interim uh, studies and statements that were made, opportunity for congregations and individuals to respond to those things. And then finally, the, the statement as it came to the churchwide assembly this year um, uh, was developed uh, to the point where it was released publicly, I think maybe about March of this past year, and again, opportunity to make some comments, although by that time it's pretty much in concrete in terms of how it's going to come uh, to the churchwide assembly. So that's the background and, and the, the, the prehistory, as I say. Um, uh, interestingly enough, um, uh, what got added to this was uh, the, um, uh, the desire for uh, consideration of what the ELCA's position had previously been about gay pastors. And uh, so a couple of church-wide assemblies ago, or maybe just the last one, I guess 2007, uh, it was given to the Sexuality Task Force the responsibility of bringing in some recommendations um, about how to handle um, uh, gay um, gays and lesbians in terms of ordained ministry. Um, uh, in my opinion, that was probably not a good process because really a task force is supposed to do one task, and in this case they were developing a social statement, um, but that's what they did. And so they brought into this church-wide assembly really two different matters. One was the social statement, and the other was the recommendation about ministry policies. Well, that was a long answer to a short question. Well, it's a very, I think, a very important question, trying to set the, the background, the context for, for what's taken place, um, because it was a, you know, kind of a, a really a watershed decision here, uh, as I look yes. at it. And I'm glad you mentioned that there really were two decisions. One was the social statement, um, which had to pass by two-thirds majority, which got exactly two-thirds, as I recall. That's right. The social statement needs a two-thirds vote, and it got that um, right uh, exactly. If there had been one more vote uh, against it, it would not have uh, would not have prevailed. 
the ministry standards required only a 50% vote, and um, that actually came to the assembly in uh, the form of uh, several different resolutions that got varying numbers of votes, but the sort of crucial one was about 55%, I think. Isn't it kind of odd that the statement took two-thirds, but the change, the standards of ministry only took a majority? I mean, couldn't it have been easy that the, the social statement didn't get passed, but the ministry policy did? Well, it, uh, it that conceivably could have happened and uh, almost did. My guess is that if the social statement had not been approved, that the ministry changes still may have been, and then we would have been in a really odd situation. But um, the, the two-thirds, you know, two-thirds is a supermajority, which is generally, at least in the ELCA, uh, restricted just to very specific kinds of things, constitutional amendments, um, uh, ecumenical uh, agreements and uh, social statements, and that is the way it was set up originally in the ELCA, and uh, uh, that's just the way it's been. Technically, the ministry standards didn't require a vote of the churchwide assembly at all. Um, they that could have been done by the church council, um, but uh, they never seemed to incline to want to do that. I mean, what they'd already kind of. I mean, you had your vision and expectations, but. And many synods, as I understand from reading forum letters, those vision expectations were not being enforced. And the churchwide assembly, you know, two or three years, was it the last one in 2007, said, oh, go gentle in enforcing these. Yes. Basically. Well, that's, that's a kind way to describe what they did, yes. <laughs> <laughs> they actually, I think the language that was used was they encouraged bishops and synods to uh, refrain from discipline or use restraint in discipline. Uh, one other thing before we get into some of the other questions, but just to help everybody understand a little bit, I mean, I, I don't know, from the discussion on the American ALPB boards, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm trying to figure out if the majority of the ELCA churches and pastors are really behind this, or if it was just kind of like the majority of the people who got, who went to the, uh, uh, the voting delegations, and for us in the Missouri Synod, I mean, we all get together in our little circuits, and we choose one pastor and one lay person, and that's who goes. But you guys have a bit more of a process of terms of uh, how many have to be women, how many have to be almost a quota system, don't you, for the lay people there? Uh, well, it's, it's both simpler and more complicated than that. Um, uh, simpler in the sense that Yes, there is a quota, uh, the uh, sort of balance that's required. Sixty uh, percent of the voting members, as they're called, have to be lay people, uh, and forty percent, obviously, uh, pastors. Uh, the lay people have to be evenly balanced between men and women. So those are the two uh, ways uh, that there are sort of restrictions on um, who can go. Uh, but the ELCA very deliberately chose the term voting member rather than delegate or representative because there's a, the idea, the theory behind it is that uh, those who go to the churchwide assembly are not really representing specifically the places that they come from, but they are chosen by those places to use their best judgment for the whole church. And the truth of the matter is that the way they are elected is different from synod to synod, um, uh, so that in some synods uh, it's very similar to what you're saying, where uh, what we would call a conference gets together and you know chooses who's going to go from their conference. In other synods, um, it's the synod assembly that makes the choice, and uh, the conferences are only have only a limited involvement in how that happens, so it's sort of a hodgepodge in a way. Whether they represent, uh, I mean, it, it's clear that they represent a majority of the 1,045 voting members of the churchwide assembly. It's not clear to me whether they represent a majority of the ELCA or not. I rather doubt it, but how would we know? <laughs> I, I, one more thing, and then I know i got to get Dale get a question, but isn't it kind of odd that in a churchwide assembly, the majority of the people would be lay? I mean, if you're dealing with issues of theology, isn't that what's supposed to be pastors are trained in? Um, well... Um, Yes, I think it's odd, but that's the way the ELCA was, was set up. Uh, uh, 
and you know I don't know what the percentage is um, in Missouri Synod. Uh, I know different denominations do it differently. The United Methodist Church is 50/50, for example. Uh, the Episcopal Church has a more complicated system where they have actually three houses, I think, uh, and each you know a house of lay deputies and of, of clergy and then of bishops and. On, at least on certain matters, each of the three has to agree. So uh, it's, you know, it's a matter of polity, and, um, you know, who's to say whether it's a wise one or not? Uh, I, uh, but I certainly agree with you that it seems odd that on theological matters that the majority making decisions would be lay people. It seems odd to me, yeah. anyway. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, all right, so... Um I guess before we get into questions specifically about um, the decision, um, could you just give us a sort of short summary for those who aren't quite familiar with all the details of what actually happened? Sure. Uh, well, let's say a word about the social statement first. The social statement um, addresses homosexuality with some ambiguity and essentially says that Within the ELCA, there is not a consensus about the um, sort of moral status of homosexual acts. Uh, and then it outlines, I think it's four different positions on a continuum that um, uh, that it says represents the, the varying points of view within the ELCA. Uh, so the long and short of that is then what the social statement says is we don't have consensus on that issue. What the ministry uh, standards now say, say um, it, it, it's essentially that uh, whereas in the past, up until this church-wide assembly, the official standard of the ELCA was that um, gay and lesbians, gays and lesbians who were not sexually active could be could serve as ordained ministers. Uh, what it now says is that gays and lesbians who are in what the documents call um, a, a publicly accountable, lifelong, monogamous, same-gender relationship, uh, that they can be ordained and a congregation may call such a person if they choose to do so. Uh, so it emphasizes, first of all, the um, continuing reality that it's really finally up to a congregation who they're going to call as their pastor. Um, but it, it eliminates the restriction on um, gays and lesbians insofar as they are in a committed relationship. Now, what does that mean exactly? And that's the question that nobody really has the answer to. Um, uh, Presumably in a state where same-sex marriage is legal, uh, a marriage would represent a publicly accountable, lifelong, monogamous, same-gender relationship. Um, but in states where that's not possible, uh, it's not yet clearly defined. In a sense, all of this was now passed on to the church council, which has to revise what the standards actually say. Uh, in other words, the church-wide assembly has really said we want to change the standards to reflect this, but now it's up to the church council and somebody else before it gets to the church council to do the spade work to really write the language that will define how that's going to work or how it's supposed to work. Okay. All right. Um, by the way, for our viewers, those who are watching the video, it looks like we're um, having a little bit of a, a bandwidth problem on uh, Dr. Johnson's end, um, so getting a little bit of a blurry picture. Uh, we apologize for that. So, uh, so how does this work with uh, on the local level? So uh, I'm in a conference, and I'm really opposed to this, but now I've this church over on the way calls a... Um, it is uh, uh, homosexual gay pastor, and I mean they, they're supposed to be something about a bound conscience. How is this yes. all really Yes, the bound conscience concept um, is uh, allegedly drawn from the writings of Paul, um, and I can explain the idea as I think it's intended to mean. I, I'm not sure I can 
I'm not sure I can really uh, do it justice because I think there's still a lot of confusion about what this means. But the idea is that um, the, that we are to respect the bound conscience consciences of one another, so that if um, you are conscientiously opposed to gays uh, serving in the ministry, um, my task is to um, uh, is to find a way to allow you to to honor your conscientious position, uh, which is to say, I'm not going to force anything down your throat. You know, I'm going to allow you to hold that position and not to punish or bad mouth or, you know, anything like that. But the flip side of it is that you have to allow me the freedom of, of my conscience to uh, be able to, if, if my congregation wants to call uh, a gay or lesbian pastor to, to do so. Um, you know, the theme at the churchwide assembly that was hit again and again by uh, Mark Hansen, the presiding bishop, was uh, to raise the question, can we find a way to live together in one church body, even though we disagree quite uh, strenuously about this issue? And so that's what the bound conscience language is supposed to enable us to do. Whether it will do it or not is another question. But <laughs> I mean, I, I, to me, the most shocking thing that was said, I mean, about in the whole thing, was the amendment that was put forth by committee, which says, stated, recognizing that this conclusion differs from the historic Christian tradition and the Lutheran confession. I mean, how do you bound how do you say that's okay? We we, we agree to disagree yeah. on this. I respect your bound conscience. When they would admit it, this is in complete contradiction to Scripture and the Confession. Well, I think that's an amendment that's going to um, really be interesting to see how it gets worked out. And I'll I'll correct you. It it um, this was kind of a convoluted process, but that was uh, an amendment that was actually put forward by one of our synod bishops. Uh, and the way the process works is anybody that wanted to submit an amendment could do so, and then it went to what was called an ad hoc committee that kind of processed these amendments. And some of the amendments they recommended that the assembly adopt, and others they did not. This one they recommended that the assembly adopt it. Um, and you're absolutely right. Uh, what it essentially says is that we recognize that what we are about to do uh, is not consistent with um, uh, with scripture and with the confessions, um, but we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> and uh, I'm frankly astonished that they approved that amendment. And as I said, I think that that's that amendment is going to be the focus of considerable conversation in the in the months to come. Um, and uh, to me, the fact that they were able to approve that amendment, and yet uh, there was a, another amendment recommended by the ad hoc committee, which essentially strengthened strengthened the statement about what marriage is supposed to be about, and they, they didn't approve that one. So um, I don't know. <laughs> you know, legislation at a churchwide assembly, it's like the old saw about, you know, not watching sausages manufactured or you'll never eat one again. <laughs> So they they just they flat out admitted that this is unscriptural. So this this isn't a matter of um, sort of well we interpret scripture differently. It's we're just gonna you know just admit that this is not a, a scriptural position. Um, I don't think it's quite fair to say that, Dale. I um, and I I unfortunately don't have the language right immediately in front of me at the moment. But I I think what it said, or what it intended to say, was that we recognize that this is contrary to the um, to two thousand years of interpretation of scripture and uh, confessions. But there are some in the ELCA who believe. Uh, that that interpretation is no longer, um, I don't want to say valid, but but is no longer the only possible way to interpret Scripture. 
So I, I don't really think it's fair to say that they were just tossing the scripture overboard. I'm, I'm also not sure it's quite fair to say it's just a different interpretation. I guess I'd say it's a different hermeneutic. It's a different way of interpreting the scripture that leads to different conclusions um, between among different people in the ELCA. Okay. The actual terminology is recognizing this conclusion differs from historic Christian tradition and the Lutheran confession. Some people, though not all, in this church and within the larger Christian community, conclude that marriage is also the appropriate term and used in de- to use in describing similar benefits, protection, and support for same-gender couples entering lifelong monogamous relationships. Right. That is yeah. one complex statement. <laughs> it's, it's very complex, and, and it may be that the complexity is what allowed it to be passed without people really realizing what they were doing. <laughs> well, it's, it's sort of <laughs> ambiguous, too. Because it's, are you saying that it contradicts interpretation of the Lutheran confessions, or does it say that it it contradicts the Lutheran confessions? And the way that it's worded, it could be read either way. Yes, yes, it's it's uh, it's delightfully ambiguous, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you put that, delightfully. <laughs> this is the kind of writing you get from ALPB's four letter. You'll get wonderful little witticisms like that. You should sh- subscribe. Get that subscription in tomorrow, folks. Yep, you're getting lots of points from me here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dale, go ahead. Next question. Okay, so we talked a little bit about congregations, this whole bound conscience thing. All right, what is this? So for a congregation who... Um, does this mean that that if a congregation decides, you know, we don't agree with um, with this, we don't want a gay pastor, that that means that they will not that that they they will be able to say, you know, in our criteria of what we're looking for in a pastor, we definitely um, we want to narrow it down and say all of our pastors um, that we're even going to consider are going to be heterosexual, or is that going to yeah. be considered? Yes, I th- I think that at least uh, at least in the foreseeable future, that's exactly what it means. Um, and uh, you know, most bishops I think would um, would argue that they they already respect that kind of um, that that kind of sense from a congregation on a on a variety of um, in, in a variety of ways, so that. Um, you know, a, a pastor, uh, a, a congregation that's quite traditionally liturgical in its um, uh, in its uh, worship life um, is probably going to say to the bishop, you know, we really want a pastor who can continue to lead us in this worship style, and we're not interested in somebody that's going to come in with, uh, you know, uh, guitars and snare drums, and because that's not us, and. Most bishops will say that uh, they are wise enough to to know that that needs to be honored, and so that is how I would expect this to work, um, at, at least in the beginning. Uh, whether it will always work that way or not is another question, because uh, the history within the ELCA of this is um, congregations were led to believe that if they did not... Um, uh, if they did not want to call a woman as a pastor, that uh, that would be respected. And yet there are at least some synods where now, 30 years later, congregations are told, you know, uh, well, sorry, you know, you're, you're going to we want you to interview these three people and one of them is a woman. So uh, get over it um, now, whether that'll happen in this instance with uh, with uh, gay clergy or not. I, I don't know. Uh, I. My guess would be um, it's going to be a long time before a congregation will be encouraged to interview or call uh, a gay pastor if if they're not willing to entertain the notion. Okay. Now I've now, seen. That's how it will affect, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's how it affect the churches. But but what about like the seminarians? I mean, um, if I remember right, form letter re- reported that uh, Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary became a reconciling in Christ. Uh, seminary, which essentially said we yes. are open to gay and lesbian, open gays and lesbians coming here, endorsing them for ministry. So, so I'm a seminarian now. I mean, how's that going to work with my conscience being bound? 
well, it's probably going to mean you're not going to want to go to Pacific Lutheran Seminary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the ELCA has, uh, I think it's eight different seminaries, and um, the climate uh, at them is all quite different. So, um, you know, I think uh, some are much more... Um, open to gay students, gay seminary students, and others, um, it's tougher sledding. Uh, uh, So I think that that's, I I don't expect this to really impact that reality uh, very, uh, very dramatically. Um, I think that uh, um, at at the most, uh, at the more conservative seminaries, probably life will get a little easier for gay seminarians who happen to be there, but I don't know. I don't expect a big, a big change in that, uh, in that climate one way or the other, I guess. So you don't see this, um, the more conservative students, um, being sort of, well, here, let me give you an example. Um, at, uh, one of the seminaries in Iowa, um, there was, a uh, guy who, was told that he needs to use gender inclusive language when referring to God. Mm-hmm. And he said, no, I will only use um, masculine uh, pronouns when referring to God because that's the way the Bible yes. does. And he was told, no, if you do not use gender inclusive language when referring to God, you will be downgraded. Mm hmm. Yeah, well, that's a little different issue, of course, and uh, I think that's an appalling um, uh, stance on behalf of a faculty member. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, uh, what can I say? <laughs> it's, uh, I'm just wondering uh, if, that, you know, the same, if you take a, a stand against homosexuality, um, you know, is this going to lead to you being downgraded? or even... In theory, the concept of bound conscience should tell us no. <laughs> so, but again, it's, it's too early to see how that's all going to play out. Okay. So, so get a hold of the guy, Dale, and if it comes up again, think, I have a bound conscience on this matter. Well, that's I think there will be a lot of that going on, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm remembering, and there's a couple guys that were in similar situations, uh, the guy I'm thinking of is now working on his doctorate at uh, the Fort Wayne um, Seminary. So, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, there may be some of that going on too. <laughs> so, um, so, now another other big thing that you guys did at your churchwide assembly, of course, was uh, you voted. I think it was like 98 percent in favor of full communion with the United Methodist Church, and yes. you already are in full communion with uh, the Presbyterians and uh, Reformed Church in America and the United Church of Christ and also the Episcopalians, I mean... Uh, and, and the Moravians. And the Moravians, yeah. the Moravians too. Um, so how is this going to affect those uh, ecumenical relationships? And, I mean, then as a follow-up, how is it going to affect... Do you think it's going to affect our relationship uh, with our two Lutheran church bodies? The sexuality actions, you mean. Uh, yeah. How that's going to affect... Yeah. Um, well, uh, again, I have no crystal ball here. I would say with those groups with whom the ELCA is in full communion, I don't expect that this will affect too much with the possible exception of the Reformed Church in America. Uh, that's the, the most conservative of the um, of the three Reformed churches that we have uh, this agreement with. And uh, I have heard rumors that there may be some parts, some people in some parts of uh, that church that may see this as a reason to pull out of that relationship. Uh, Obviously, the United Church of Christ uh, is already already has gay clergy and embraces gay clergy, as does the Episcopal Church, so I don't think this will affect those. Uh, The United Methodist Church is an interesting case because they do not uh, permit gay clergy and have actually a fairly conservative stance on uh, homosexuality. Um, 
Uh, and uh, so it would it, it would be interesting if there were quarters in the United Methodist Church who said, wait a minute, you know, we just proved this and now you've done this and we need to rethink this. I don't honestly think that that's going to happen from the judicatory structure, but it could happen from um, there, there could be a movement in that direction from among some more conservative United Methodists. Uh, with regard to the LCMS, um, I don't know. Uh, President Kieschnick, of course, brought greetings to the churchwide assembly on Saturday. Uh, he uh, did, in my opinion, a very fine job of being uh, gracious and um, uh, and kind and yet still being forthright. And he made it very clear that... Uh, he, on behalf of the LCMS, uh, regretted very much the actions that we had taken and that there may well be consequences um, for those actions. And I think the, you know, the, the conversation that I hear is that there may be a tendency or a, a, a faction, at least in Missouri, who uh, wants to pull out of the few things that we still do together um, uh, particularly some of the relief work and, and so forth. And I, I understand that feeling in Missouri. I personally would hope that that does not happen, but, um, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of like parents and children, you know, when, when there's not much left to take away, um, <laughs> And you want to make a point uh, that then sometimes you have to take away things that you don't really want to take away. And if that happens, I, I think that everybody loses. But we'll have to see how that how that plays itself out. I, as you we know, also, I, you know, incidentally, I, uh, just to say on a different ecumenical front, we got a similar expression of great concern from um, Archbishop Wilton, the Roman Catholic uh, uh, head of the Roman Catholic uh, Ecumenical uh, Conference, who brought video greetings and was quite forthright, uh, j- nearly as forthright as uh, as President Kishnick in in um, expressing his dismay at what we had done. As a um, you know, from my discussions with the ALPB boards, uh, you know, my own struggle with um, okay, Lutheran Social Services, New England, how supportive can I be of this now? Um, and it's it's going to be very frustrating. Uh, what do you think the fallout's going to be within the ELCA? I mean, how do you, I, just, I mean, reading the boards, some of the guys are very, people, and, and women, uh, both men and women, are very upset uh, talking about looking at other church bodies. Uh, yeah. Uh, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch today had an article about, you know, the the, the rumblings going on, and I guess uh, the LCMS has gotten, like, you know, over 50 uh, inquiries and uh, Lutheran Churches and Mission for Christ has gotten a ton of them, uh, basically, is what the guy put it. He says it's just, you know, 30 a day. Um, mm-hmm. So how do you think this is going to – what effect do you think this is going to have on the ELCA? Well, I think uh, I think that's – I think that remains to be seen. Um, I think there's a, a – Quite a lot of geographical difference uh, in this. Um, you know, I'm in California. I don't. Um, I think it's possible in my synod, which is 215 or so congregations. Uh, I think it was would be conceivable that we might lose five or six who would actually withdraw from the ELCA. I think there would be a lot more who will severely cut their funding um, in terms of benevolence giving to the ELCA. Uh, but in other parts of the country, I think there's a much more, um, there's much more anger about this and much more likelihood of people pulling away, uh, particularly across the, uh, the upper Midwest, um, um, many places in, in the South, especially the more rural South, uh, some places in Pennsylvania, uh, where there's a lot of, uh, angst um, in the Pacific Southwest outside of California. I think in Arizona, there's uh, considerably more upset about this. Uh, it's it's easy to make threats and it's easy to make phone calls and ask questions um, when push comes to shove um, to leave the ELCA. 
means to go someplace else. And where do you go? Uh, I think that's the thing that a lot of pastors and congregations are going to wrestle with. And um, uh, I think in many cases we'll uh, probably decide that it's not um, – it's not necessary for them to organically leave the ELCA. You, know, you can leave a church body in more than one way, can't you? You can you can leave it uh, legally, or you can leave it emotionally and psychologically. And I, I think that will happen a lot. I think there'll be a lot of congregations that will just say, "Okay, we're going to do our thing, and we'll we'll still stay part of this church body, but we're not very enthusiastic about it, and we're not going to." You know, support it much. So, I mean, I think that's a that's not a good thing. <laughs> Would be nice uh, if somebody could say, "Okay, here's a church body where y'all can come and you'll be welcome." And you mentioned Lutheran congregations and Mission for Christ; they've essentially said that. Uh, ecclesiologically, though, there are a lot of unhappy ELCA Lutherans who would not be happy in the LCMC. Um, uh, same thing with LCMS. I mean, there uh, there are certainly some things about the LCMS that are very attractive to a lot of the LCA Lutherans. There are other things that are not attractive at all, and so I don't see much of a movement from ELCA to LCMS. Uh, but I don't know. You know, ask me this again in a year, and I think we'll have a better sense of it. I think a lot of it at this moment depends on how pastors deal with their congregations and how bishops deal with the congregations in their synod. Uh, I think if congregations and and individuals feel that they are being listened to, that their concerns are being taken seriously, and they're not told just to, you know, shut up and get on board, uh, then I think maybe the loss to the ELCA won't be as bad as it might be. Um, But if, if that doesn't happen, then I think it could be very serious for the ELCA, ELCA. I think financially, particularly, could be very serious. Okay. Right. So my question is, do you see this as being the end? Is I mean, there's been a lot of uh, sort of moving to more inclusion and, and, and things like that. Um, there's been all these task forces, on, um, and obviously there's still work to be done as far as sort of hammering out the details. But... Do you see this as being like okay, uh, sort of uh, uh, to put it bluntly, you got what you wanted. Are you happy now, um, or do you see this still as a step moving to something else? <laughs> uh, I don't quite know where else to go. Where else it can go? Um, at the moment, um, uh, I think that um, I think the interesting thing is that now that this decision has been made, there's a lot of talk around the edges about fragmentation, both among the advocates of full inclusion, quote unquote, and the opponents of full inclusion, and and the reason is that. There are theological and especially ecclesiological divides that run through the ELCA uh, that are um, uh, that run through groups in their positions on on this issue that we've recently resolved, if, if, if that's the right word. In other words. Uh, those who have been opposing, um, oppose the social statement, oppose the change in ministry standards, uh, are united in that issue. But when you get much deeper than that, there's a lot of fragmentation and a lot of um, disagreement about, particularly about ecclesiology. You've got everything from very churchly, um, uh, the evangelical Catholic uh, kind of mode to radical congregationalists. And so to to keep a coalition together once the the reason for the coalition has gone um, is going to be very difficult. And it's the same thing on the other side, even among those who uh, have been supportive of, you know, the good soil movement and the, you know, Lutherans concerned and all of those. Uh, once you get beyond the questions of sexuality, there's a, a lot of diversity uh, theologically and lit- liturgically and ecclesiologically. And it'll it'll just be interesting to see what happens. 
I, I, I have to, to, you know, when you talk about these different coalitions, once you get beyond their thing, it's almost like the enemy is my enemy is my friend. And then once yeah. they're on, they're starting to fight. I'm glad to know you guys are just like us. <laughs> you know, we've got that yeah. in common. <laughs> well, it's called the old Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's alive and well in both of our church bodies. Yeah. Dr. Johnson, any concluding remarks that you would like to make uh, about this whole thing? And one of the, uh, by the way, if we can invite you back later on, sometimes we get uh, comments uh, from uh, our listeners. And if they come up with any questions or anything, we would like to have you back on, maybe to respond to some of those. Uh, we would send those to you ahead of time so you'd know what would be coming. But, sure. uh, because I, I, I have really appreciated having you on here, just, just yeah. to let you know that. Yeah, it's been, I've, I've enjoyed this very much. Uh, concluding comments, you know, I guess, and I'm assuming that your audience is primarily Missouri Synod. Is that a, a safe <laughs> assumption or Ironically, what are your demographics, guys? Most of the most. feedback that we've gotten has been from ELCA members or pastors. Really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. interesting. But we're very big in, in, in China. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, my uh, the thing that I would want to say, uh, and I I said this uh, to my congregation this morning, and um, I've said it in a number of cases that that right now it, it's a time to take a deep breath and to uh, to be praying for one another and to be trying to find the way ahead and and. Um, I, I don't know what that way is going to be. I, I had a parishioner this morning who told me a great story about a Finnish uh, fellow who used to always, when things got very uh, kind of difficult and convoluted, he would say something in Finnish, and they would ask him, what does that mean? And he would say, walk slowly and drink ice water. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought that was that was perfect, you know. It's uh, it's a difficult time for us in the ELCA. It's a, and it's a difficult time, no matter what side of this issue you're on. And uh, the last thing that we need is people kind of piling on right now, either from within or without. We we need time to to uh, walk slowly and to have some good swigs of ice water and and uh, count to ten and and um, not do anything precipitous. Um, as you're aware, uh, uh, in September, Lutheran Corps, which is the coalition that um, ha- was most active in opposing um, both the social statement and the minute change in standards, is having a meeting, convention, assembly, I don't know what to call it, um, in uh, outside of Indianapolis. And uh, uh, I, I, that'll be a month after the fact, and hopefully people will have kind of calmed down and be able to um, have a more realistic and fruitful conversation about what the way ahead might look like. Um, um, so I hope that that's uh, I hope that's that's advice that we can all take, uh, uh, recognizing that um, I think as as all of us have to recognize, we have very strong feelings on this thing, and you know what, we may just be wrong, you know, and and we there, we need to have some humility, uh, a good dose of it, before we go charging off in all directions. Okay. I think you once said that in, a, in one of the forum letters, as I recall. So they, sometimes we need to have the humility of saying, you know, I could very well be wrong here. And, and yeah, that is, well, that I have a tendency to repeat right. myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's um, a pastor Pastor John, thing. be assured that uh, you and uh, your church body are in my personal prayers as you wrestle this thing through. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, want to be my, do my absolute best as uh, a, a brother Lutheran pastor to be supportive of uh, those who are holding firm as they can to scripture and the confessions. Uh, realizing we have our disagreements, but you know what? So long as we're honest about them, that, that they don't bother me that much. I mean, you know, maybe I disagree with them, but yeah. they just you guys feel the Lord is, and so that's really where He is. But I, where I can, I want to be able to support you guys and, and be a uh, uh, supportive friend and pastor. I appreciate that. All right. Well, Dr. Johnson, thanks again uh, for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. It's been fun. God bless. God bless. We thank uh, Pastor Johnson for uh, his time and his comments. 
I think they're very sensitive, very pastoral, uh, very caring. Uh, maybe you have a different opinion. Maybe you have further questions that you'd like to ask, as I mentioned in the interview, that we sometimes get that comments from our viewers. Uh, you can send them to us at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Yep. Or if you're watching this in YouTube or uh, Rever or Blip or um, any other uh, the video sharing websites where we post these, um, feel free to post a comment there, and we will uh, pass it on that way. And so we really appreciate those comments. So uh, take care. God give you a wonderful week in His grace. And next week we'll be back to our usual five stories. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless.